We're looking for volunteers for the event, and Dr. Kenny has decided to make it a bonus point opportunity. So basically, it's an event sponsored by the Juniper Council, and we're constructing a wall on the Mather Quad, and basically it's for people to come, and they can um, write instances of oppression on it, and we just want volunteers to, you know, watch the wall and make sure no one's, you know, trying to put graffiti on it or anything. So uh, my email is tck6 at case.edu. So if you're interested, uh, I definitely need more volunteers. And everyone who sent me an email today, I tried to respond to everyone who emailed me before about 1.30. So you can check your emails for that. All right, thanks. Thank you very much. Do, do, do. All right, let's, which computer am I using today? Add new client. It doesn't want to listen to me. <laughs> Do, okay, fine, I don't care. I have no idea what's going to pop up here. We'll find out. It is Friday, of course, and it's raining, so what better thing to do than be in a chem class at 2 o'clock on a Friday afternoon with a little bit of rain? It'll teach you nice. First of all, I'm sure that it is the questions that have come up. Monday, I will have a list of opportunities for you for bonus uh, that I can think of. Um, there are several seminars coming up. I'll uh, let you know right up front, one of the things that I'm going to do is any two, uh, any two seminars between now and the end of the semester that you have a desire to attend, you may, but then you also have to write a reflection, which reminds me, if you're going to sit and observe the wall, the requirement was you have to write a reflection about what that two hours meant to you. You're not just sitting there and watching the wall. Hopefully, you're, you're thinking about it a little bit. So you, en between now and the end, end of the semester, any two seminars. There will also be other opportunities like the Chem Fiesta. The Chem Fiesta will be Sunday, today's the 4th, and 21 is 25, 27th. Sunday the 27th from noon until 6 or thereabouts in here. That'll be a bonus opportunity. Bonus opportunity. No, I'm going to actually put a bonus form out on the web that you can download and you will email that form to me so that I can extract it in. I'm sorry? No, per event. Yes. The other thing is several of you, it's a small number of you, are still having problems with the uh, PDF. Here's what I, and though several people told me they were having problems and then they got it to work. About a third or 20% of you are sending me files that are not PDF files. Please. If you click on the send email, that will only work if you have an email client on your computer. Those of you who have that know what I'm talking about. Those of you who don't, don't worry about it. 
my recommendation is download the PDF, save it to your desktop, edit the saved file, save it again, and then email me that as an attachment. That's what I'm saying. Save it before you put any data in it. Okay, I've had several people tell me that and yet 80% of you have been able to do it. So it's got to be something about, it's probably all you dang Mac users, excuse me. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Hey, watch that. You can't what? You can't download it as a PDF. Then it's how you have your browser set up. Thomas? Can I email it to you? No, I can't email attachments to the whole class. <laughs> I can, I'll tell you what, if by Monday you still don't get it working, we'll talk on Monday and I'll give you an alternative. But keep trying over the weekend. If, if all else fails, go to software.case.edu and get the new version of Acrobat. No, it doesn't have to be science related. As a matter of fact, there's a great seminar Wednesday. Uh, Dorothy Handy is going to be here. I think that's her name. So, all right. Let's see. What else can I tell you? Final exam is on uh, Thursday, May 1st, right? 7 o'clock at the night? Huh? May Day, yes. Very good. Do you have Kappa? Not yet. You will. Sometime I'm going to find time to get on my computer. Yes, it is. And so if you've only done the one that we've done, you got 150 points. So don't push me on Kappa, right? All right. We're going to change gears now. We're going to talk about electrochemistry. We're going to try and tie up a bunch of loose ends for the last couple of lectures. The first one is we're going to go back to redox equations. Okay. We've talked about precipitation reactions now. We've done quite a bit with acid base. Now we're going to go back to redox equations. Except, so we have to review how to balance these things. So if we take a nice simple one. Do you do? Oh, what's a nice simple one? The, the, the Danielle cell, which we're going to get to. We'll give you one you don't even have to think about. How would you balance that equation? It's already balanced. How do you know it's balanced? Well, there's one copper on each side, there's one zinc on each side, but more importantly, the charge is balanced. As we start talking about redox equations, it's going to be crucial that you make sure you indicate charges and that you check to make sure the charge is balanced. Because if the charge isn't balanced, something's gone wrong. Remember, we can break this one up as well into two <coughs> half reactions. And, uh, and just a quick review, remember a half reaction, is, it can't exist, can't happen on its own. You have to have both an oxidation and a reduction. Remember oil rig, oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. If you lose electrons, <coughs> the thing is oxidized. If you gain electrons, it's reduced. If the oxidation number goes down, you've reduced it. If the oxidation number goes up, it's a, redu it's a uh, oxidation. Whoa, that's not good. It's one of the, the problems with the computer after dropping something on it. Now we're going to come back to that one, but let's uh, try to balance one that's a little bit tougher. Iron 2 plus dichromate to give you iron 3 and chromium 3. Okay, anybody remember the steps? Oh, there was a whole set of these steps. What were they? the first one was break it into two half reactions.
So the iron two goes to form iron three. We can balance that one without doing a whole lot of work. There's nothing else in here, so I just need an electron on one side and I can balance that reaction. The dichromate's a little bit tougher. process was once you get the half reaction, if you want you can assign oxidation numbers, but I'm going to encourage you not to. It's just an extra step that you don't need. It will work whether you do it or not. So we're going to balance the dichromate. First you balance the atom in question, the one that changes oxidation number. Odds are good that it's not hydrogen or oxygen, it's something else. In this case you've got a chromium atom. Let's assume that it's that, so we need two chromiums on this side. After you've balanced the atom that changes oxidation state, then you, anybody remember? No? Did we do this? Oh, well then let's start from scratch, one. Separate the equation. I could have sworn we did this. Not in detail? You didn't do the steps? Well, guess what? First, separate the half reactions. Second. Balance the atom that changes oxidation number. And you do this for both half reactions. You can do them at the same time or separate from each other. Third, balance oxygen by adding water. Balance hydrogens by adding H plus. Balance the charge by adding electrons. and then recombine the two half reactions, making it so that the electrons cancel. There's no such thing as a bottle of electrons, or at least not one that we can afford. And so you can't have extra electrons. They have to cancel each other out. And then, if needed, Whoops, I can't neutralize acid with H plus. If necessary, neutralize the acid by adding OH minus. And the reason why that one says if needed is you'll be asked to balance these equations either in acid solution or basic, basic solution. Ninety per, all the time, do it in acid first. And then if it says it's basic, neutralize the acid that's left and make it basic. All right? So, back up to this reaction. First we separated the half reactions. We looked at the iron and we went from iron two to iron three. That one, there's nothing else in there, so it's pretty easy to do. We can balance that one by inspection. We just have to add an electron. We don't have to go through all the steps. But the dichromate's different. Balance the atom that changes oxidation number. There's two chromiums on the left. We need two chromiums on the right, so I just added a two in there. If you follow these steps in order, you'll never go wrong, by the way. We haven't worried about the oxygen yet, right? All we're looking at is the chromium. But what's the next step? Balance oxygen by adding water. So on the left-hand side, we have seven oxygen. On the right-hand side, we therefore need seven water so that we balance the oxygen atoms. After that step's done, balance hydrogen 
by adding H plus. So on the right hand side there are seven times two, 14 hydrogens. So I need 14 hydrogens on the other side. So I've got 14 H pluses. Balance the charge by adding electrons. This is where it gets complicated. On the right hand side there is a plus six charge, two chromium plus three ions. On the left hand side you've got a minus two charge from the dichromate and you've got a 14 plus charge from the hydrogens. So you've got a net charge of plus 12. So we have plus 12 on the left plus six on the right. We can only add electrons, we can't add anything else. So that we means we need six electrons. Now at this point if you compare the two half reactions and the electrons are on the same side of the arrow of the two half reactions, you have a problem. They should be on opposite sides. Luckily they are. If you scroll down, the next step says recombine the two half reactions so that the electrons cancel. When I say you can't buy a bottle of electrons, that's my way of saying you should have no electrons in your balanced equation when you're done. They should cancel each other out. So if that's the case, I'm going to multiply that reaction by six. If I multiply that reaction by, and all I'm looking at is the electrons. I've got six electrons in the second reaction, I've got six now in the first and I add these two together, the electrons should cancel out if I did everything right. That's what I get. And at this point, you should check it. If you're not stressed for time, check each and every atom. There's six iron on the left, there's six iron on the right, there's two chromium on the left, there's two chromium on the right, there's 14 hydrogen on the left, there's seven times two is 14 hydrogen on the right, and there are seven oxygens on the left and seven oxygens on the right. If you are stressed for time, never on my test, I know, I, it's Friday, my humor gets real bad on Fridays. If you are stressed for time, just check the charge. If the charge is balanced, it doesn't have to be zero. If the charge is balanced, the reaction is balanced. I have yet to find an example where the charge was balanced and the reaction wasn't. So if I run out, I'm running out of time, I'm going to say I've got a minus two, a plus 14 and a minus, uh, excuse me, I have a six times two is 12, minus two is 10, plus 12, 14, I have a 20, plus 24 on the left, and on the right I have a plus 18, plus 24. If the charge is balanced, odds are in your favor that the reaction's balanced. That's the process. It never fails. It takes practice, but you can take some pretty ugly looking equations and I didn't bring enough ugly ones with me, so I'll make one up. Uh, da, 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 da. How about this one? Um, permanganate. Sometimes you can do these by inspection. You can just look at it and say, okay, it has to be this, this and this and that's okay too. But there will be somewhere, no amount of staring at it will give it to you. Doesn't matter which one I pick on. I usually do try to do the easy ones first. I minus goes to form I two, so I need two I minuses and then I have to balance the charge. So that's a pretty easy half reaction to balance. Okay, after we split it into half reactions, you balance the atom that changes oxidation number. Again, don't bother assigning oxidation numbers. Just look for the strangest atom you can. In this case, manganese. 
Oxygen's pretty normal. There's one on the left, one on the right. We don't have to do anything. After you balance that atom, balance oxygen by adding water. Then balance hydrogen by adding H plus. and then balance the charge. We have a zero charge on the right, so we need a zero charge on the left. We have a plus three on the left, where people do fall down, and you'll, and you'll know, I'll show you what happens if you do this wrong. I'm going to do this one wrong, so you may want to hold off writing this down for a second. I'm going to assume that I have to eliminate all the charge from the hydrogen, so I need four electrons. Hopefully you all see I only need three because I have a minus one charge on the MnO4. If I add these two together now, I'm going to get, let's see, I, have, I need two of these, because I have two electrons here and I have four here. So I get four I minus plus MnO4 minus plus four H plus goes to form two I2, MnO2, and two water. Now, if you check, you'll find out that all the atoms are balanced. I've balanced each and every atom. This is another reason not to check the atoms necessarily, but always check the charge. The charge on the left is minus four, minus five, plus four. I have a minus one on the left, and I have zero on the right. Everybody see it? So if I don't balance the charge at this point, I did something wrong. I got to go back and find my mistake. Well, I know where my mistake is. So let me get rid of that, hopefully. It just doesn't want to go away today, all right? So now, this has to go away too. Now I've got three electrons for the second half reaction, two electrons for the first. The easiest way to fix this is to do a three and a two. So I get six I minus two MnO4, eight H plus, uh, three, two, four, Again, the electrons should cancel out, and they did. Make my M look a little nicer. There we go. And now if you check the charge, I've got minus six, minus eight, zero on the left, zero, 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 zero on the right. If this were in basic solution, We're going to neutralize the hydrogen ions with hydroxide. So how many hydroxides would I have to add to neutralize the acid? Eight. If I add eight hydroxides to the left, what do I have to do to the right? I have to add eight hydroxides to the right. Whatever I do to the left, I'm going to do to the right. So I'm just going to add eight OH minuses. Well, when I neutralize the H plus with OH minus, I get? If it's basic, shouldn't you neutralize OH with H plus? Because we always balance these with H plus, we always do it in acidic solution, there's always H plus in there, we have to get rid of the H plus. And the way we get rid of it is by adding hydroxide. The net result is I'm going to have hydroxide ions as one of the products. So it ends up being a basic solution. Where this solution is an acidic solution, because there's hydrogen ions in there, and these are all equilibria, by the way. They're not left to right. They are actually equilibria. So I'm going to end up with a basic solution here. The only thing left now is I should simplify this. I have water on both sides of the arrow.
And as I said, it's always a good idea to check your charge. The charge on the right now is eight minus, and the charge on the left is six times minus one plus two times minus one, it's also eight minus. To be honest, I don't know if the rules are outlined in your book this way. I think they're close to this, but if you follow this process, you can balance any equation. And let me show you the, the worst kind you can get, if I can find one. Yes? Yes? What do you mean, what, are, what exactly we're doing? I'm sorry? You started off by putting an equation out. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what kind of equation that was, but it was an option on the right or not. And I really, I don't know what level you're at, but I'm really not following what Now you've got a couple of people with you, don't worry. <laughs> what kind of reaction is it? We learned three different kinds of reactions at the start of the year. Acid base, precipitation, and oxidation reduction. In an oxidation reduction reaction, Two things change oxidation states. Something goes up in oxidation number, something goes down. In that reaction, it's pretty obvious, and we can look at that one and say, the copper gained two electrons to become copper metal. The zinc gave up two electrons to become zinc ions, okay? So the copper is reduced and the zinc is oxidized. Everything okay so far? That's a nice, simple equation. If they were all that simple, it would be great. Unfortunately, if I take iron ions and put them in the presence of dichromate ions, and in this case, I'd probably use iron nitrate and sodium dichromate and mix them together, what's going to happen is the dichromate's going to, the chromium in the dichromate is going to change its oxidation number to make chromium three, and the iron is going to change its oxidation number to make iron three, okay? When we talked about oxidation reduction reactions, um, this third one was a, an example of that. When we first did these, we, I gave you a hint as to be able to, when you were trying to identify what kind of reaction is it, oxidation reduction, acid base, or precipitation, there was a big hint as to find out when is it an oxidation reduction reaction. What was the hint? I know, it was back in October. If you start with any element or any compound with zero charge, zero oxidation number actually, if a reaction occurs, it's going to change oxidation number. In that reaction, iodine has zero oxidation number. Remember how we assigned oxidation numbers to these? We spent a little bit of time talking about it. I'm not going to worry about it anymore because oxidation numbers are just a way of keeping track of things so you can write chemical formulas. You're going to find out that you're not going to have to know these equations because I'm going to give you a table of all of these. These are all half reactions. In every single one of these reactions, the first one there, fluorine plus two electrons to make fluoride ions, you go from an oxidation number of zero for fluorine to an oxidation number of minus one. Ozone plus H plus will make oxygen and water. You can take ozone with a zero oxidation number and make ozone oxygen with a zero oxidation number. Ozone doesn't change oxidation, or oxygen doesn't change its oxidation number. H plus does in this reaction. Cobalt, all of these are different reactions we're going to look at. And the reason why we're doing these now is because we use the tools that are available to us. We're going to talk about how this works. Where do you, what, are, what good are those electrons in any one of these reactions if they're not in the balanced equation? If I take that reaction 
and I split it into its two parts, there's electrons moving around in this reaction. There has to be electrons moving around, but when we combine the two half reactions to make the overall reaction, it's hard to tell where the electrons are. The reason why I put this first one up here is because this was the first battery that was ever made. I'm sorry? In ancient Mesopotamia, I didn't know that. I don't know, even know where Mesopotamia is, or was for that matter. I know, I haven't taken my sages class, so maybe I should. Copper ions plus zinc will react to form copper and zinc. And it doesn't look like much of a reaction, but if you take galvanized zinc nails, that's the, the easiest place, galvanized nails are, are coated with zinc, and you put them into copper solution, what'll happen is those nails will dissolve. This is an aqueous compound. And you'll make solid copper. So if I do this like this, I'm going to take a beaker, and I'm going to fill it with copper ion solution. And into that beaker, I'm going to hang a piece of zinc, okay, zinc metal. What will happen without any input from me, ooh, we can add color. Is we're going to start to take copper, the copper ions, and we're going to coat the outside of that nail, that piece of zinc, with copper metal. Now, where would you use that? None of you are old enough to know the answer to that question. It is electroplating. You get to see my good artwork here. Thank you. You can tell what it is. Coche. What's that? Bumper. What did they used to put on bumpers? They don't anymore. Chrome. Have you ever seen what happens when you peel the chrome off a bumper? Do you know what's underneath there? Iron. It, probably not iron, actually. Copper. Find a cheap metal, any cheap metal, and plate it with copper, or excuse me, plate it with chrome, and it looks great. It doesn't rust. What is rust? What is, the, what is the process of rusting? It's taking iron solid and making approximately iron hydroxide. You're taking iron metal and you're going to make iron ions. And nobody ever believes this, so I'll just show it to you. There's a whole website. Let's pull it up here and see what happens. Do a Google search. Cost of corrosion. Corrosionimpact.com. That's how much corrosion costs the U.S. annually. $276 billion a year. You want to get rich? Figure out how to eliminate, how to re eliminate corrosion. $48 billion is lost by the utility industry every year to corrosion. Where? Pipes in the ground. Think of all those pipes that are running through the ground carrying natural gas, other gas, oil. The federal government passed legislation six years ago that said every single centimeter of, and they did say centimeter, every single centimeter of pipeline has to be visually inspected by the year 2012. Think about that. You have to, visual, you have to go in either with your eyes or with a camera and visually inspect every single piece of pipe that's in the ground. 
How are you going to do it? Why'd they do that? Because they've been in the ground for 50 years. If they've been in the ground for 50 years, what do you think the chances are that there are holes in them because they've corroded? Pretty high. And so if there's a hole in a natural gas pipeline, guess what happens? Boom. You get a gas leak and you potentially get an explosion. And all these pipes that were laid in the ground 50 years ago are now corroding very, very quickly and the, and the failure rate is skyrocketing. And so you have to go in and check all these pipes. Well, how much do you think it costs to go out there with a backhoe and dig up every inch of pipe? A lot. So how are you going to do it differently? Robotic camera is one way. Guess what? Robotic cameras ain't cheap. A what? A what? Ditch witch. What's a ditch witch? A trencher. Okay, so instead of a backhoe, we use this big thing with teeth on it and dig it up. We're still going out there with manual labor digging these things up. It ain't going to work. There's got to be a better way. There's a whole area of research called non-destructive testing that allows you to go in and check things without tearing it apart. And chemical reactions that deal with electrons moving around. There's got to be a better way to do that. Chemical reactions that deal with electrons moving around the whole branch of um, chemistry we're moving into allow you to go in and check those things. The biggest feat of engineering when I was young was the, na was the uh, Alaskan pipeline. When they built the Alaskan pipeline to take gasoline or oil from the oil fields down to Prudhoe Bay, Think about the, what's going on there. If you want to see a sample of it, by the way, if you go out uh, Chagrin Boulevard onto 87 and you keep heading east about six miles, you'll come to this organization that's got this huge geodesic dome uh, for their headquarters, ASM International. And outside there, they have a sample. They have a piece of the Alaskan pipeline. It's about this big. It's huge, and it's about this long. And the only reason I know that is because that's where I used to work. But you take that big piece of pipe, and this thing stretches for hundreds of miles along the Alaskan tundra. Some places it's underground, most places it's above ground. Guess what? It's exposed to the elements. In order to get iron to rust, and it's made of iron, what do you have to have? Water, air, air oxygen actually, and one more thing. Energy. Not energy. Not heat, table salt. You need ions. And we're going to talk about why on Monday, but you need ions. If you have iron, water, oxygen, and ions, you will get rust. If you want to eliminate rust, you eliminate the oxygen, you eliminate the water, or you eliminate the ions. Any one of the three will eliminate the rust. Well, this natural gas pipeline is, is stuck out there on the Alaskan tundra. For hundreds of miles, they have to protect it. How do you think they protected it? Let's see, we have to eliminate air, water, or electrons. What's the first thing you think they did? They painted it. You just coat it with paint. Why? As soon as you coat something with paint, it's a barrier from the water to get to the metal, or the air to get to the metal. But guess what? They get hail in Alaska. When hail hits something metal, what do you think happens to the paint? It chips. Now you've exposed part of this pipe. OK, air and water can get to it now. Well, we don't have to worry about salt or electrons, do we? Yeah, you do. There's naturally occurring electrons or um, ions floating around that are going to attack that thing. So they did something really ingenious. Go back here to, whoops, wrong one, that one, to that picture. We're going to change gears here. Anybody ever heard of James Burke? He had a public television show that, that jumped around all the time. I'm going to jump around a little bit today. Then you got your calculator? Actually, I don't have my cell phone. Anybody got a cell phone? That'll work. I'm not going to do any calculations. No one has a cell phone today, right? There's a cell phone. There's a, a calculator. What's in these things? 
Lithium batteries. Lithium ion batteries. Why lithium ion batteries? If I look at this list here, and I go all the way down to the bottom, lithium ions. Somebody's calling you. Somebody's texting you? Ah, uh, she's sitting next to you. Thanks, Monique. Am I supposed to answer it? No. Oh, okay. Do it. What the heck? Lithium ions react with one electron to make lithium metal. If you look on your cell phones, if you look on your calculators, if you look on your computers, you'll find out there's lithium ion batteries in there. What atomic number is lithium? One, two, three. It's three. Dilithium crystals from Star Trek? Oh, it's Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Call. Jeff, you just hung up. Jeff. Jeff V. Jeff Okay. Not important. Not important? <laughs> That's okay. Oh, well, <laughs> I think I hung up on him. When lithium reacts with electrons to form, to get, it's Dan now. Thanks, Dan. All right, Dan, I know you're sitting in here. So, lithium reacts with an electron to form lithium metal. Look at the, the voltage. That's what these numbers are. Those are voltages. Lithium will generate three volts of electricity when it reacts with one electron. In order to get those three volts, somehow we've got to get those electrons from somewhere. Where do you think those electrons come from? They might come from fluorine. They might come from gold. They might come from oxygen. What we're going to find out is that every single one of these, and it doesn't matter how it's made, works the same way. This is an electrochemical cell. Inside of this battery, there are chemicals, and this is an alkaline cell, so therefore it has hydroxides in it. Alkaline means basic. There are chemicals in here that are reacting in such a way as to generate voltages. And when I take these half reactions, wake up computer, thank you very much, When I take those half reactions, like copper ions plus zinc metal to make copper metal and zinc ions, if I go back to this table here now and I say, OK, right, I have to zoom out so I can find it. There it is. There, copper ions, that's plus one electron. Where's copper ions plus two electrons? I passed it. Did you see it? There it is. Copper ions plus two electrons to give me copper solid. It says that this, the voltage of that is 0 0.34 volts. I know, you'll see that in a second. And then the other one we had was zinc ions, uh, 0.86. The other way, there it is. Zinc ions, there. Zinc ions plus two electrons to give me zinc solid. It says the voltage of that is negative 0.76 volts. So notice it's zinc ions plus two electrons to make zinc solid. Go back to the computer. I've got zinc solid to make zinc ions and two electrons. It's the reverse reaction. What do you think the cell potential is for the reverse reaction? The opposite of whatever I found in that table. If I reverse the reaction, I just change the sign. So this is 0.76 volts. Now if I add those two reactions together to make that reaction, copper ion reacts with two electrons to make copper metal, and it will generate 0.34 volts of current, electricity, excuse me. If I react zinc to form zinc ions and two electrons, it will generate 0.76 volts of electricity. And if I do it properly, I put it in the right size kind of package, I can generate 1.1 volts of electricity. Anybody know how many volts these are? This is a nine volt battery. What about the AA or AAA batteries you use in your calculators or your walk? 
Those are one and a half volts. What about C cell and D cell batteries like you they used to use in, in flashlights? One and a half volts. This is nine volts. One and a half volts, nine volts. One and a half, oh, I bet if I multiplied six times one and a half, I'd get nine. There are six batteries. There are six electrochemical cells in this battery. Each one of those cells is going to generate one and a half volts of current, or volts of electricity. It's not current. Every single battery that's out there has exactly the same chemical reaction. And on Wednesday, you'll know what it is. I'm not going to tell you what it is today. It's in your book, though. I know. Something to look forward to. So. It's a sunny weekend. Get out there, have some fun. I will see you on Monday.